-hmm. All right, so the first thing I want to show you guys is uh, on, oh, of course, come on, come on. Hey, why doesn't it do this website? Supposed to just know me, but never does. So I posted because there it's not part of the textbook, right? So what I did was I posted here in the functions continued section. There's uh, combining functions, both questions and the solutions. And then the one to one functions and their inverses, the questions and the solutions. So those are the ones that I want you to focus on. Um, and so they're just the, I think the questions. How did I do it? Oh, yeah, these are notes from a different course, but I mean, they're the same stuff that we're going through. So uh, that we're going through, we're going through some stuff. Uh, no, so here it has like a little blurb on what to do and then it has the the questions to work through so there's a lot of questions here some of these are, are harder than what i would expect of you um but since you have the solutions it might be fun to work through um and then don't worry about that optional stuff but unless you want to i think i have the solutions for those as well so don't worry and that was the combining functions and then the one-to-one -one functions and their inverses uh, is two pages, but not too bad. So I posted those with, with the solutions so that you have something to work through. Uh, but we also left one hanging last day. So let me see if I can find it. Uh, oh, but first thing, so for this one, I'm kind of, uh, no, so for these two kind of sections, I guess, or from the section last day, uh, I don't have anything prepared. So just do those so that you have enough practice so you feel comfortable. And then maybe we'll, we'll do a, a quiz or something. I don't know, I, but I'll give you guys enough notice. So anyways, they're just for fun for now, I guess. That's your guys' favorite thing, just for fun. <laughs> yeah, no need for a quiz. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so there's no, those aren't due or anything. Just work on those. And remember that some of them are harder than what I would expect you to do. But, um, first things first, the final exam schedule is posted. So our final exam is on Friday, December 11th, uh, 9 to 12, which has got to be like one of the first slots. Um, <laughs> Oh man, the statue to Westminster. Yeah, that's, we, we do observe that. So I'll have them move the final. It'll screw up the whole final exam schedule. <laughs> um, algebra, right? All right. Uh, so this is our final exam. So you can put that in your I don't know, your calendar or whatever. Uh, it's just nice to, to know when it is. Right. And then I, I shared the link to the rest of the final exams if you don't have it, if you haven't checked it out already. Usually it's all the buzz on campus whenever the final exam schedule is out. It's posted, it's posted. Anyways. Now, uh, continued from last day, because we kind of, I went, over time. So you guys are so patient. I'll see what I can do about today. Make it up to you. Um, yeah, so I went through and I finalized all the grades on, on WebAssign. So 
Uh, but if you do have any questions, then just let me know. But uh, they should be good to go. Well, not on WebAssign, but on Moodle. I'll put this down here. Uh, test one grades the finalized ones where I've kind of combined your grade scope and your and your web assign. I had to think which class this was for a second. Uh, uh, finalized are posted on Moodle. Okay. Saturday exams. They make them half an hour later, which screws everyone up too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's see here. <laughs> oh, put this down here. So continued from last day. And then we had another example to work through as well. So don't worry. Um, <clears throat> Helps if I've got the copy paste tool. It's basically the summary of what we wanted to do, I think. Yeah. Mm. Sorry, just cleaning it up here. Okay. So, uh, let's see here. So we had the, we found the inverse of f of x, which was this, I'll kind of scooch them over here. And we had our original function f of x, and so, and then we were able to find the inverse. We had to show that f of x was one to one, right? And so, uh, and we'll do another example today. And then uh, we have to confirm that the inverse that we found is indeed the inverse by showing that uh, f composed with the inverse equals x. So everything should fall out and we should just end up with x. And then uh, we left off here at the inverse of f composed with f of x has to equal x. So that's what we have to show. It's going to be similar to the first one that we did, um, slightly different. Similar. Okay, so knowing that we have f of x and f inverse of x, um, my editor's picks. Um, we want to stuff f of x into f inverse of x, right? And let's see here. f inverse of f of x <clears throat> means that wherever we see an x in the inverse of f, we have to stuff in f of x. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this a multi-step thing. Um, and I'm just going to replace all the x's with f of x first. So I get negative 2, bracket 1 plus f of x, and bracket all over f of x plus 1. I missed the comment about the webcams. For me, you don't need webcams on. I don't know what those crazy computer science guys are doing. <laughs> Sarah wants to watch you cry. Too <laughs> funny. So, now, wherever I see an f of x, so there are two of them, I'm going to stuff in my f of x. 
I have to be on <laughs> such camaraderie. Uh, thank you, Zach, paying attention. I was looking over there, I think. I don't know, probably not. I think I was looking at the numerator, actually. Even bigger mistake. <laughs> we have to be really careful because now we're gonna be dealing with fractions, right? So one thing you have to keep in mind is that you have to have a common denominator to, uh, to deal with fractions. And so uh, that can really trip people up. So we get negative two, and then I'm gonna use big brackets because I'm gonna have these fractions here. Uh, one plus, and f of x was x minus two, which I'm gonna put in brackets here, uh, over x plus two and bracket all over f of x, which is a fraction here, x minus two over x plus two, minus one, my mistake. Okay. So here, in order to combine these, right, as well as the denominator, I need to have a common denominator. Right, and so here, I'm just gonna highlight, um, need common denominator. And we haven't really dealt with, and that's my mistake, because uh, in my other two courses, we've been, we've been dealing with fractions this whole time. So uh, we've been doing other stuff, sets and all that crazy stuff. Um, I forgot that we have not gone through that many fractions. So although I, I do kind of expect you to, um, to be pretty good at dealing with fractions, I guess we haven't really talked about them yet. So, um, explicitly. So what you need, right, to, to add or subtract two fractions, one, you could rewrite as a fraction. We've done that. I know, uh, one over one. So in order to combine these fractions, you need to have a common denominator. And there are fancy ways that you can do that, uh, but I just like to take whatever is in the denominators, multiply them together and make that my common denominator. It makes for a pretty big common denominator sometimes, but it's the easiest and safest thing to do. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna multiply by one. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take one times x over 2 over x over 2. x over 2 over x over 2 is just 1, right? So I'm taking 1 times 1 is 1. I'm allowed to do that, so everything stays the same. So what I have is I have, I'm going to leave this negative 2 on the outside because it's just multiplying this thing. 1, and then to show that I'm multiplying by that common denominator of x plus 2, because I need to have that in the bottom. I'll use a different color. Minus x minus 2 over x plus 2. And then same thing, uh-oh, dealing with a page break here, of course. Let's get this all down to the same page, how about? <clears throat> So now, same deal on the bottom, I've got x minus 2 over x plus 2. They're going to have that same common denominator, minus 1. And then just looking over here, what's my denominator? If I have to make it common, then I have to multiply this by x plus 2 over x plus 2, which is just going to be 1. So times x plus 2 over x plus 2. I'm going to close that bracket. So what I get is I'm going to simplify this thing, right, and put it over that common denominator that I've forced to be x plus 2. I don't know if you guys can see this, but it's been like flurrying this whole time. And now there's snow. I know. Brutal. 
Don't worry, it's been freezing this whole time. But no, it's actually snowing. Great. Uh, all right. So we've got, now we can combine these over our force common denominator. Now I've, now I've really done it. There we go. Sort of. So I get negative 2 times x plus 2. So 1 times x plus 2, I can just write as x plus 2. I'll put brackets around just to keep it nice and clean. Minus x minus 2 in brackets all over x plus 2. This dot is a multiplication, just to indicate that I'm multiplying and Kelowna is significantly better. Let's do a double, double, double greater than Edmonton. <laughs> exactly. And this is a multiplier and this is a multiplier. Sometimes I throw them in, sometimes I don't. Inconsistent is what I am, not really x minus 2 minus 1 times x plus 2. You could definitely just drop that 1 times, uh, but I just want to show that it's still there over x plus 2. <clears throat> so what I have, I can simplify this, right? x plus 2 minus x minus 2. This is going to simplify quite a bit. Same thing with the numerator here. And then I have to remember what to do with um, when I'm dividing a fraction by a fraction, I have to flip and multiply the denominator. So what I get is I get negative 2 times, and I'll just write this out, x plus 2 minus x plus 2. And I think that's where I went wrong last time. I think I confessed to you guys. But I did it wrong one time. I did. Um, but that's okay. I knew I did it wrong because I didn't end up with it equaling x. What the heck? It's supposed to equal x. That's what's nice about these things. Even though they're tedious, you know that at the end of the day, you're supposed to end up with just an x. So you just got to keep going until you get there over x minus 2 minus x minus 2 over x plus 2. Cancel some stuff. x minus x and then 2 plus 2 of course is 4. Uh, and then x minus x can go away as well. And then negative 2 minus 2, negative 4. So we end up with negative 2 times uh, 4 over x plus 2 still divided by negative 4 over x plus 2. Okay. Here I'll put a little side note, right, that a over b divided by c over d becomes a over b times d over c, right? In case that's helpful. If you've got a fraction, you flip and you multiply. <clears throat> so now we get negative 2 times 4 over x plus 2 times x plus 2 over negative 4. What happened? Here I'm feeling all confident because I didn't muck it up this time, but Feel like I did. Yeah, something is not right. 
because it's supposed to equal plus turn into a minus in the top. Okay. Better start from the top here. Mm -hmm. X. Okay. Minus this guy. Nope. He's okay. Fourth line from the bottom. Thank you. Here. <laughs> Where my screen was. Mm. <laughs> but Oh, this turn into this. Wrong. Algebra, right? <laughs> and here I was feeling so good. Okay, that one turned into a plus. I better own my mistakes here. That one's a plus. The denominator is a minus. Right? Yes. This one's a plus. Plus, minus. Okay. Changes some stuff, doesn't it? And this can just go straight to HE double hockey sticks. Okay, here we go. X plus X, 2X, and instead 2 minus 2 goes away. I really bungled that one. But I think we're back on track. Minus four over X plus two. Let me just make sure before I actually do it. Cancels, cancel, good. Okay, we've got it sorted. Negative two times two X over X plus two times x plus 2 over negative 4. Back on track. <clears throat> x plus 2 is going to cancel with x plus 2 because we're multiplying all the way across here, so we're allowed to cancel. And then I've got negative 2 times 2x so I get negative 4x divided by negative 4. These two are going to cancel. Therefore, f inverse of x is indeed the inverse of f of x from way long ago. We'll do another one, a fresh one. See if I can keep my adding and subtracting straight for this one. Any questions though before we do? Okay. So our second example, was f of x equals 2x plus 3, make sure I copy this one down, 1 minus 5x. So 2x plus 3 over 1 minus 5x. Okay. 
So, first thing we need to do, right, step one, uh, show that f of x is one to one. Right. Step two, we have to find the inverse of f of x. Find f inverse of x. Step three, show that, and we can use slightly different notation if we want to, f composed with f inverse of x, which is f of f inverse of x, right, depending on how you like to write it, equals x, and that f inverse composed with, whoops, composed with f of x, which is also f inverse of f of x equals x. So all of these, right, require some theory, right? If it's one to one, how do we show that? Well, we need to show that if I let f of a equal f of b, then what I'm able to show is that a must be equal to b, right? If I get the same output, I must have given it the same input, making it one to one. And then to find the inverse of x, or the inverse of f of x, what we do, we had two different options. Right? We can either replace our x's with y's and then solve for y, or you can solve for x and then, um, and then replace the x's and y's later. Either way, you're going to replace the x's and y's. And then we do the function composition, just to make sure that we have the, the right inverse. Okay. So, is f of x equal to 2x plus 3 over 1 minus 5x a one-to-one -one function? We'll start there. We have to start there. Well, if it is, then if I let f of a equal f of b, then in the end, what should fall out is that a equals b. So what I do is I just take this, replace my x's with a's on this left side, and then replace my x's with b's on this right-hand side. Now, this can feel kind of silly sometimes, especially if we're dealing with something like this. Um, but what you'll see if, if you ever try a, a non-one-to-one -one function is that it actually doesn't work. So, and it can be quite difficult. So we have 2a plus 3 over 1 minus 5a. If it's equal to 2a plus 3 over 1 minus, sorry, not a, b, 5b. Oh. Clean up this b. <laughs> Dealing with fractions again, right? What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna slowly try to um, solve for A or B, whichever one you prefer, and then hopefully they end up equaling the other one that you didn't choose. So I'm just gonna multiply, I'm gonna cross multiply here, across here, and across here, and I'm gonna have to expand, and then I can, um, can kind of bring together like terms and, and just hopefully cancel quite a bit. So I get 2a plus 3 times 1 minus 5b is 2b plus 3, and I'm going to put brackets around these things because I should, because the whole thing is multiplying, times 1 minus 5a. And I'll just show what I'm doing here cross-multiplying. 
So now if I expand these things, right, I get 2a times 1 is 2a. 2a times negative 5b is negative 10ab plus 3 times 1 is 3 plus 1, uh, sorry, 3 times negative 5b is negative 15b. Doing the same thing on the other side. And because I don't want to muck it up like I did before, it looks good so far. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to expand this out as well. So you get 2b minus 10ab plus 3 minus 15a. <sighs> Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to collect like terms and for me what I like to do is I just like to move everything to one side and then solve for one of the letters, either that's A or B. Um, so I'm just going to throw everything to the left hand side and set the other side equal to zero, right? If I've subtracted everything away from the right hand side, I'm left with zero over here, so you need to keep track of that. And so what we get is 2a minus 10ab plus 3 minus 15b, and then minus 2b plus 10ab minus 3 plus 15a. Right? So here we go. Minus 2b plus 10ab minus 3 plus 15a equals 0. Now, we do get to cancel some stuff, so that's really nice, All right? So let's go ahead and cancel some of this. Negative 10ab plus 10ab, that's going to go away. Plus 3 minus 3, that's going to go away. And then if we collect like terms, right, we get 2a plus 15a, and then negative 15b minus 2b. So we get, let's see here, we get 17a minus 17b equals zero. Or if you prefer, you could have just moved all the b's, for example. I like to eliminate negatives whenever I can. So I would probably move my b's over to the right-hand side again. And so what I get is I get 17a is 17b. But if I divide both sides by 17, I'm left with A equals B. Good. So therefore, f of x is a one-to-one -one function. That's what we were able to show. If an input A gives me the same output as if I inputted B, then A must be the same as B, right? That's what it means to be one-to-one. -one. And so, and that's how we show it. We show it by saying, okay, well, F of A, I'm going to let it be F of B. And if I'm able to show that what falls out is that A must be equal to B, then I have a one-to-one -one function. Good. So step one, complete, show that f of x is one-to-one. -one. Great. We have to have a one-to-one -one function in order to be able to find the inverse, right? So um, we can now find the inverse, right? We can only find the inverse if it is a one-to-one -one function. So it doesn't have an inverse unless it's a one-to-one -one function. So to find the inverse, remember f of x is the same as y is equal to, and I'll, I have it here, 2x plus 3 over 1, oops, 1 minus 5x. Let me just confirm that that's what I had, 2x plus 3, yeah. <clears throat> 
pen. And just remembering that f of x and y, you can use those interchangeably, right? And so if you prefer to just have y instead of f of x, sometimes that makes it hard if you're trying to substitute things into your function. Uh, that's why we use this function notation. But because we're only going to be dealing with x's and y's, you can just read f of x as if it's y, and maybe that um, helps a little bit. So what we do to find the inverse, right, is we've got two options. You could solve for x, so you could rearrange this whole thing, right, y equals 2x plus 3 over 1 minus 5x, rearrange it and solve for x, and then replace your x's and y's, and then you've got your inverse. Um, or you can replace your x's and y's up here, and then solve for x, um, solve for y rather, which is more natural, and then you've got your inverse. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have uh, swap x's with y's, then solve for y to find f inverse of x. So we have x is 2y plus 3 over 1 minus 5y. Just doing a complete switcheroo uh, with those two variables. So now I'm going to solve for y. And so I'm slowly going to try to move all my y's over to one side. So I get x times 1 minus 5y is 2y plus 3. And because I'm trying to shake out a y here, I'm going to need to expand this out, right, and try to collect, collect all my y's on one side and everything that's not y on the other side. So I get x minus 5xy is 2y plus 3. So I can move this 2y over here, trying to solve for y, right? And so, um, so here, if I move this 2y over to the left-hand side, I can move this x, this lonely x, over to the right-hand side in kind of a, a dual move, right? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this over here and this over here. So I get negative 5xy minus 2y. And I'll stack my equal signs here. I did a bad job. Is 3 minus x. Okay. Now I can factor out this common y. And I'm left with y times negative 5x minus 2 is 3 minus x. <laughs> Just making sure when this happens. Okay. So then y is going to be 3 minus x over negative 5x minus 2. In my notes, I have y equals, and you'll see why they're the same, x minus 3 over 2 plus 5x. How did that happen? I pulled out a common negative here, negative, and then I brought it upstairs instead, negative 3 minus negative x x minus 3. Mm. Like 
that. I think I just landed here because I did it. I moved some things over to the right hand side instead of the left hand side. So it just, I want you to convince yourself that either of these are, they're the same, right? So whichever way you get to is good. Um, often textbooks and stuff, if they have a negative like this, a common negative on the bottom, they'll pull it up to the top and just kind of incorporate it and, and move it around. Um, but you don't have to, they're equivalent. So this becomes y is negative 3 minus x. Oops. Over 5x plus 2, so y must be negative 3 plus x over 5x plus 2. Minus three is allowed over f five x plus two. So they're equivalent, All right? But either of these, you don't have to get to here. If you get to here, that's great, All right? But if you ended up here, because of like I said, it just depends on. Um, which side you move stuff to, right? So if you did it in a slightly different order, then you might get something more like this. But just convince yourself that they're the same. Okay. So we have this inverse, and because we've got this kind of nicer looking thing, right? Uh, let's use this one maybe, or I don't know, we can use this one, doesn't matter. Let's use the one we found. Scrap my side notes. So now, where were we in our... Uh, we found the inverse of f of x. And so now we're going to do the, our function compositions to make sure that both of them equal x to prove that they are, in fact, the inverse. I'm going to copy this, so I'll need that. F inverse of x is, let's do the one that we found. We'll have to deal with a lot of negatives, making it trickier, negative 5x, at least for me, because I don't like negatives. So now, show that f of f inverse of x equals x. Okay. So into our f of x, wherever we see an x, you're going to place f inverse of x. Now, whether you do that by just plugging it in right away, that's fine. Uh, I'm just going to illustrate it by actually just plugging in the f inverse of x notation. So I get f of f inverse of x is 2f inverse of x plus 3 over 1 minus 5f inverse of x. So now I'm going to replace those f inverse of x's with the actual inverse. 3 minus x over negative 5x minus 2 plus 3 all over 1 minus 5 times 3 minus x oops, over negative 5x minus 2. 
We're gonna to need to expand this, deal with the fractions again, right? Making sure that you have um, that common denominator. And then eventually we're gonna end up with a fraction over a fraction that we can just simplify. So we get two times, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna force in the numerator, I'm gonna force my common denominator to be negative five X minus two. But what I might do is I might pull that negative outside. I haven't decided yet. No, let's keep it. Let's just keep it like it is. Uh, it will work, it'll just be kind of nastier. That's okay. Two times three minus X over negative five X minus two plus three, and then I'm forcing that common denominator of negative five X minus two over negative five X minus two. All that is over one times, and then here I'm gonna force the same common denominator, right? on this one, so I get times negative 5x minus 2 over negative 5x minus 2 minus 5 times 3 minus x over negative 5x minus 2. With the common denominators, I'm allowed to smush the common denominator and, and make it my denominator uh, and also combine the numerators. So I get, I'll leave a space here, two times three minus x plus three times negative five x minus two. Really hoping I didn't screw up any pluses or minuses this time over negative 5x minus 2. And that's all over. Well, 1 times negative 5x minus 2, I, I'm just going to leave it as negative 5x minus 2 minus 5 times 3 minus x. All over negative 5x minus 2. A couple of things I can do simultaneously, right? I can simplify the numerators and I can also flip and multiply now that I've got a fraction over a fraction. I can flip the, the denominator fraction and multiply. So I get, let's see here. Should I expand this first? Yeah because some stuff is gonna cancel out. So I get six minus two X plus, oops, sorry, minus, minus 15 X minus six over negative five X minus two, all over negative five X minus two minus 15 plus five X over negative five X minus two. So now if I kind of six minus six goes away, negative two X minus 15 X, negative 17 X. And then uh, in the denominator here, I've got negative five X plus five X and negative two minus 15, so negative five X plus five X is gonna go away. So I get negative 17 X over negative five X minus two times negative five X minus two divided by negative 17. Everyone's appreciating Riley's background right about now. And Ashley's too. <laughs> so now, 
noticing that we can cancel, right? We're allowed to cancel the negative 5x minus 2 with the negative 5x minus 2 only because they're being multiplied together, right? I don't want to see any cancellation um, when we're adding or subtracting. Ooh, bunk. Negative 17 divided by negative 17. Bada bing, bada boom. Equals x. So simple. Makes you work for it. Now let's do it the other way. Going to be very similar, but we have to show it the other way too. So now show, I can't even remember which one we did here. Oh yeah, the inverse composed with the uh, inverse, or the function, sorry. Now show f inverse of f of x equals x. Yeah, two page questions at least. Oh no, I'd say probably about two, questions, two pages. Yeah, it's always the first question on a job interview. Is this invertible and can you prove it? <laughs> no, but it makes us more flexible. It makes us expand the mind. F inverse of f of x. Here we go. I need to pull them back. Where were they here? Copy. Pass them. They can be small. Maybe up here. When, when are you going to use this? On a test? In Math 251? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who knows, maybe it's all in jeopardy someday. When you're on it. <laughs> all right. So if we've got the inverse, of composed with the function, we get 3 minus f of x over negative 5 f of x minus 2. Uh, so f of x is 2x plus 3 over 1 minus 5x. So we're going to plug those in. 3 minus 2x plus 3 over 1 minus 5x all over negative 5 times 2x plus 3 divided by 1 minus 5x minus 5x. What did I do? Nope. Oh, minus two. Caught it early. Let me just make sure. The inverse three minus x minus five x minus two. Okay, good. 3 minus 2x plus 3 over 1 minus 5x, okay, negative 5, 2x plus 3, 1 minus 5x minus 2. Good. It's always a good start when you do right the second time. <laughs> All right. So a little bit faster. I'm going to force the, the common denominator. 
right? And so here I get three times one minus five X minus two X plus three over one minus five X. Right. Not showing all the steps, but still finding that common denominator, one minus five X, one minus five X, right? And I've already combined them. Uh, all over negative five times two X plus three minus two times one minus five X. Again, forcing that common denominator of one minus five X. <clears throat> Yikes. Tsunami warming, warning? Yikes. Thanks, Carson. <laughs> In this case, Edmonton is better. Yeah. Uh, I know. You can all come stay at my house. <laughs> I think Kelowna is usually fine. Um, I think what they were saying was that it would go to probably Hope the last time I heard. They were like, oh yeah, it would go to Hope, but yeah, that's not good. Um, and man. All right, so we get, if I expand the numerators and I kind of simplify, we'll stick to the fun stuff that we're doing. We'll check on the tsunami warning later. So three minus 15X minus two X plus three over one minus five X. How wild and crazy do you think I am? Expand this and flip and multiply in the same, same go? Let's do it. One minus five X over negative 10 X minus 15. Uh oh, I need more room, don't I? Ooh, cheating. Uh, Negative 10x, negative 15 minus 2 plus 10x. Boink. I flipped and multiplied. I expanded all in the same breath. I'm getting a little bit cockier. Uh, what did I need here? Well, those better cancel. All right, well, these cancel for sure. Negative 10x plus 10x goes away. Negative 17. I've mucked it up, haven't I? Here. I didn't bring my negative in. Yeah, don't do it on one line. <laughs> here is where I went wrong. I need to bring this negative in here. Minus three minus three. Now three minus three is gonna go away, which I knew it had to, that's how I knew I'd done it wrong. So now I have negative 17 X divided by negative 17, which of course is gonna cancel, cancel X. Hmm. 
Think, um, so therefore, F inverse of X equal to, where was it? Three minus X over negative five X minus two, three minus X over negative five X minus two is indeed the inverse of f of x equal to 2x plus 3, I'm running out of room here, 1 minus 5x. Even though my space is technically unlimited. <laughs> Are you guys ready for something easier? <laughs> hey, that's what I like to see. Some, uh, some enthusiasm for something different. Uh, let's do uh, exponential equations. So we're going to get into chapter 10. <laughs> no more function compositions for now. No, I don't actually think they come up anymore. Maybe implicitly, but yeah. All right. So uh, section 10.1, we're going to do 10.1 and 10.2. Um, and it's all courtesy of this one section. Mashed potato math. Maybe you should start calling them math potatoes. Math potatoes? 10.1 <laughs> is on exponential equations. Exponential equation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, little fun fun fact. <laughs> LFPF. <laughs> um, or just LPF. Little pun fact. <laughs> so exponential equations are when you have a variable that you're interested in in the exponent, right? So we've talked about uh, or we've seen exponential functions at some point in our kind of math careers, right? But an equation of the form, an equation of the form b to the power of x equals n, just any number n, in which an unknown value, right, so the unknown value is typically x or y or z or whatever, um, in which an unknown value is included as part of the exponent. So it's not necessarily the only thing in the exponent, but it's, it's in the exponent as part of the exponent is called an exponential equation. So today we're just going to talk about exponential equations. Next day we're going to talk about uh, logs, so logarithms. We're going to talk about logs today too, but uh, log laws. Um, fun to say, fun to do. So log laws uh, next day and then We'll be done with chapter 10. And then we're into chapter three, which seems like a weird transition. Uh, and let me just make sure that that's true, which is on logic. Blah, 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 blah. Exactly. Arrested development, anyone? <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> 
just some terminology. I wish it's pretty typical to use lowercase b for the base, uh, but this is the base. And then of course, x, we can call x the power or the exponent makes more sense in this case. I'm telling Jared he can have all the pizza. It's very important. <laughs> so uh, we'll use the term exponent, but if you're more comfortable with calling it the power, then that's fine. Right? So what we're developing is our ways to be able to solve for x when it's in the power. Right? So we're getting there. Today we're just going to go nice and slow. Um, in fact, so slow that we're gonna just use our calculator to confirm some stuff. So I don't know if you guys, have we talked about, do you guys have a calculator? Or are you just using your phones? Anyways, I tried to download, so Desmos has a, a calculator thing. Yeah, so Desmos, yeah, good old TI. 83? Yeah. TA 83, you're laughing. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, you need a prescription. <laughs> uh, so I, I just before class, I downloaded the, because we've got the, the graphing one, which is the little squiggly line Desmos one, the green app down at the bottom there. And then uh, the three root 27 or the third root of 27 is a, apparently the Desmos calculator. So I, I downloaded that just to show you guys um, how it works, I guess. I saw another one that I wanted to try because what I'm looking at here is if you go to the functions, there's actually only ln and logs, which we'll see later is a little bit, we can, we can use that, but, um, on a calculator like this one, it lets you put in any log base, whatever. So we'll talk about that, but um, just something to look out for if you're trying out calculators. Okay. So first things first, whatever you're using as your calculator. Um, yeah, so Desmos, I use for graphs. We haven't done a lot of graphs. In fact, I don't think we've done any graphs. Um, but you can graph any function you want in Desmos. You just enter the, the function here. It's pretty cool. But apparently they're two separate apps. So I haven't used the calculator app before, but here we go. Uh, use your calculator. Use your calculator. Oops, to confirm. That when you do it, two to the power of eight is in fact 256. Okay. Let's just talk briefly about what it means to have exact and approximate answers. So when you get this exact answer, you have the exact answer. Um, two to the power of eight is also exact, okay? For the next one, we're only gonna be able to get an approximate answer, okay? So what you'll see is, um, because we need to start distinguishing between, this is an exact answer, whereas if I get two to do four to the power of the square root of two, okay, let's try that here. I'll go to my, uh, so I want my main menu four to the power of, so there's a little A to the power of B button. Since all the calculators are different, 
if you have any problems, just let me know, but uh, should be okay. And the square root of two all up in the top. So now I get equals uh, something different than what I have in my notes, which is so weird. Four to the power of root two, maybe I just screwed up. Looks like I did. I screwed up in my notes. 7.1029330301. What I want you to start doing is as soon as you're dealing with uh, root two or some irrational number like that, all you're gonna get from your calculator is an approximation. So when you're getting approximations, I want you to use the squiggly equals. So is approximately equal to, uh, and that'll just remind yourself that this is not the exact answer. Um, it's the approximate answer. 7.1029330301. And just make a note that this is an approximate answer. Okay. Whereas four to the power of root two is the exact answer. Okay. Make sure you're able to do something like pi to the power of three. Uh, so pi, <laughs> maybe in the functions, pi to the power of three, 31, okay, good, 31.00627668-ish, right? So again, anything involving these irrational numbers, so pi root, many roots, right, unless you land on an exact answer, uh, are going to be irrational. So is approximately equal to 31.00627668, which is also approximate. And then just make sure that you can do e to the power of 2 or something like it. Root is approximately equal to, so e is a number, right? e is a, a constant just like pi that keeps going and going forever. So as soon as you're involving e, uh, you're going to have an approximation. So e was down here in the function, so e, usually it's a little cursive e, Right, so it's not just the letter E, it's a little cursive E, so E to the power of two, or I guess there's a shortcut to the power of two, 7.3890560099. oops, should be a five. Zero five six zero nine nine, and so these are all on the left hand side. Do you have exact answers? On the right hand side, do you have approximate answers? Right. So just keep that in mind. <clears throat> So what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be trying to solve things like 2 to the power of x equals 14, and then what's x? So we're going to develop the tools next day more than today, uh, but that's where we're headed. So to solve something like, so to solve the exponential equation, Two to the power of x equals 14, we could guess and check. Oh, 
obviously I'll put little stars around our could because uh, although it's an option, it's not very efficient, but just to show you where, where things come from. So we could guess and check. So you could start with two to the power of one. That's just two, right? That's too small. Two to the power of two is four. Two to the power of three is eight. And two to the power of four is 16, right? So what we're finding here is that X must be somewhere between three and four, right? And we can, we can get more, uh, more detailed answers in a little bit here. But uh, that is going to be one way that you can just kind of check your work to make sure that it makes sense. So x must be between 3 and 4. Hmm. So in order to actually solve these, we need logarithms. So uh, we need to establish what a logarithm is. And then next day, we'll talk about log laws that make them easier to work with uh, or harder, depending on if you like laws or not. Uh, so to solve for x, when x is in the exponent, we need to use logarithms. So logarithms say that, okay, well, first we'll establish some things. So lowercase b and a both have to be positive. So for positive, b and a, and b cannot be equal to 1, we can write something like x equals log, oops, I always want to combine my o and g, and then it's just lg, it doesn't make sense. The log base b of a, so here we read this as x, I'll cut out the x portion. We know how to read x equals. Log base b of a, that's how we read this. This means, means that b to the power of x must be equal to a. So we can work back and forth between these two, right? So if we have something like this, I can rewrite it as a logarithm, and then I'm able to solve that logarithm just using my calculator. <clears throat> x is called the logarithm, which is kind of weird, right? So x, here we're saying x is the log base b of a. Uh, log base b of, yeah. Mm -hmm. A little messy, but yeah, that's what it says. Log base b of a. It's my messy writing. So x is called the logarithm, is called the logarithm, which is a little bit backwards, especially if you're seeing x in this context, right? But if you read it like this, x is the log base b of a, then of course x is the logarithm. So x is called the logarithm, and capital A is called the argument. Yeah. 
and I'll put a, a little box around here because it's kind of a big deal, big player here. So, for me at least, I, I find it very difficult to go from this to this or from this to here. It's not natural to me. Um, but just as a little helper, the statement x equals log base b of a should be read as and this is just going to help a little bit in at least in trying to go from this notation back to this notation okay. x is the log or the exponent, right? If you read exponent, it's actually more helpful. Uh, is the exponent on a base B? So now X is the exponent on a base B that gives the value a. Base b, x is the exponent on a base b that gives the value a. On a base b that gives the value a. Okay. So, for example, if I get you to write 5 to the power of 2 equals 25 in logarithmic form, then x is the exponent on base b that's equal to 25. So then what we get is 2 is log base 5 of 25. <clears throat> what if we did uh, try 1 over 8 is equal to 2 to the power of negative 3. Okay. Remembering that the logarithm is the exponent, so negative 3 is the log base 2 of 1 over 8. Negative 3 is the log base 2 of 1 over 8. What about the root of 64 equals 8? Well, it's true, right? But in terms of logs, the root of 64 is 64 to the power of 1 half. Right? So root 64 is 64 to the 1 half. Oops, that should be a power. So now you have one half equals the log base 64 of eight. Now you guys are kind of in the clear because you guys are just doing your tests at home, right? So you'll be able to have this 
uh, available and probably put it on your cheat sheet somewhere, right? Make sure that you have it um, just so you can move easily between the exponents and logs. For me, I had to memorize this garbage. So, um, let's do some more kind of involved work here. So if we have to solve for x, <laughs> confirm garbage, and probably the most fun garbage we'll do. I love exponents and logs. I think they're really fun. Uh, probably more next day than today. If we have to solve for x, 3 to the power of x equals 5, and you have to solve for x. Okay. x is the exponent on a base of 3 that's equal to 5. So now x is the log base 3 of 5. How about 10 to the power of x is 2? Again, x is the log base 10 of 2. Maybe I'll scoot this over to show that it's a solution. What if we have e to the power of x equals 0.56? Something weird like that. Okay, x is the exponent. Okay, log base e of 0.56. Mm -hmm. So there are three types of logarithms. Well, there's only one logarithm, but uh, there are three kind of classifications of, of logarithms. So there are three uh, classifications of logarithms. The first one is the common logarithm. Common logarithm is base 10. Okay. Usually for the common logarithm, that's when we just write log. So if it's base 10, log base 10, all you have to do is write log. So uh, denoted by log, which would be log base 10. So if you just see log, it's implied that it's base 10. And so this is kind of, um, log base 10 is what you use in a lot of kind of beginner logarithm stuff. And then depending on what field you go into, I know computer science, I am, well now I said I know, but I'm pretty sure computer science uses a lot of log base too. Um, but in statistics, for example, we use a lot of log base E. And so um, log base E is the next common one. which is the natural logarithm. It happens a lot in natural phenomena. And it is log base E. So it's going to be denoted by LN or lon. Some people call it, uh, 
I get sloppy and I just call it log, but that's once you've headed down a, a field of choice and then all the logs you talk about are all the same, right? So for me in stats, um, all the logs that I talk about are, are natural logs. So then I can just get lazy and call them logs. But it's technically log base E. And then all the other ones we just call arbitrary logarithms. Oops, if I can spell arbitrary. Arbitrary logarithms. Which is just base B. So that's what we've been talking about so far. We haven't really specified about uh, the common logarithm or the natural logarithm, but it's just going to be denoted by, well, itself, log base B. So here, we're talking about the logs of these things, right? But we could convert these logs into uh, the exponential ver versions or the exponent versions. And so here, the common logarithm is the same thing as 10 to the power of x equals a. X is the exponent on the base of 10, and then the argument, well, we can just plug that in here if we wanted to, the log of A, but I'm just gonna drop it. because I just wanna show what these things look like. The natural logarithm, E to the power of X equals A, and then the arbitrary logarithm, E to the power of X equals A. So they have the same form. It's just different notation for the logs, just because we um, use the log base 10 and log base E so often. <clears throat> so as a quick example, we're going to use your calculator a lot of this is just confirming that your calculator does what you think it does. Uh, use your calculator to evaluate. Log of 5.03. The natural log of 3.49 and the log of 0 0.00728. So now using this notation, right, if I have log, then it's assumed that it's log base 10, natural log, log base E, and then the log again is log base 10. So what we saw, especially on that Desmos calculator, is that there are only log and LN buttons. So we're going to get there, but uh, we will be able to do log base B in just a second. First, we just want to confirm what we get here. So if I take the log of 5.03, you should have an approximation, right? 0.70156. 79851. Uh, oh, yeah, so another term for B is like generic. Yeah, pretty well. Uh, we call it the arbitrary uh, logarithm, but yeah, you could probably call it generic logarithm if you want to. That's fine. So what we get is this is approximately equal to, right, just be really good about using those squiggly equals. Um, 0 0.70156797851. The natural log of 3.49, let's try it.
roughly 1.2. Okay. 1.2499017366. And then if I take the log, that's log base 10 of a small, small number. Log of 0 0.0072, for example, I get a negative value, puts me at negative 2.1378682 is what I had here. What happened? 0728. There, negative two point. Now I have the same thing that I can copy. <clears throat> oh, uh, how do you do the LN one? So on here, are you using the Desmos one? No? Oh, where's my T83? It's in the other room. Uh, there should be an LN button. Looks like you found it. Good. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> they usually like to hang out the log and the lawn. So uh, let's see here. Let's just copy these down just so you can go back and confirm that you have the right numbers. Uh, so you get a negative 2.1. Oops, one, one three seven eight six eight six two one. Yeah, where are the cats today? We haven't had a single cat in here. <laughs> They're all just bad boys. <laughs> Finally, a cat. <laughs> so cute. Um, phew. All right. Uh, let's see here. As promised, <laughs> you got to put her away before she realizes what happened. <laughs> so as promised, even though your calculator or a lot of calculators only have a log and an LN button, we'll be able to use those to do, um, to find the log of any base. So it's called the change of base formula. And so we can calculate the log of any base, of any base using the change of base formula, using the change of base formula. So like I said, really uh, check out your calculator because some of the calculators have a log base anything button like this one. Um, especially the TI-83 will definitely have some sort of fancy log base whatever you want button. So make sure you Find it if you if you can. If you don't have one, like the Desmos calculator does not have a log base anything button, then what you can do to calculate log base A of X is going to be the same as log base B of X over that same log base B of A. Okay. So just highlight here that this is B, log base B of X over log base B of A. Here, use convenient values of B such as 10 or E, right? 
the buttons you do have on your calculator. I like to use log base E at LAN, but that's, like I said, just because that's what I'm comfortable with. Um, so what we do is, let's show by example here, if I want to find log base 7 of 3, that's going to be the same as, for this one I can use the log, log base 10 of 3 over log base 10 of 7. Just as a quick note, this is the exact answer. And then what I calculate on my calculator is always just going to be an approximation. So log base 3 over log base 7. Let's see if I can do it in here. Log base 10 of 3, sorry. Log of 3 divided by the log, as long as you're using the same base, you're safe, uh, of 7 and bracket. I get roughly 0.56457. Five zero three four one. So roughly point five six four five seven five zero three four one. Uh, what if you try log base three of three point eight four? I'll start using ln, right? That's what I prefer. But if you want to keep using log, that's fine. I'm going to use the, the natural log of 3.84. And usually I write my ln like this. Ends up looking a lot like a limit. Very confusing when I teach calculus. Ln of three, which you should get. <clears throat> Delete all that. Oops. Ln of 3.84 divided by do, 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 ln of 3, 1.22470.1726-ish. Four seven zero one seven two six approximately. Okay. Go a little bit faster now. If I get you to solve the following equations, Ten to the power of x equals five means you have to convert it to a log, right? First, because that's what we know how to deal with so far. Next day we'll develop something more. Uh, e to the negative 0.06x equals 3.456, and then eight to the power of x equals 156.8. And now I'm running out of time here. So I'll start with A and see what happens. If I have 10 to the power of x equals 5, I can rewrite this as a log, right? And so I have x is log base 10 of 5, which on your calculator, you should find that x is oops, roughly 
log base 10, that's just the log button, roughly 0 0.6989700043. Trying to get these done before I run out of time. <clears throat> e to the negative 0.06x equals 3.456. Again, I'm going to rewrite this as, um, as a log, but just keeping in mind that when I, when I take, um, we'll end up taking the log on both sides, but um, when I bring the exponent down, it's everything in the exponent is equal to the log. So what we have is we have negative 0.06x is the log base e of 3.456. And then I'm able to solve for x. So now I have x is the natural log, ln, of 3.456 divided by negative 0.06. This is the exact answer. But we can also say x is approximately equal to negative 20.6685385. Let's do the last one. A to the power of x is 156.8. Well, that means x must be the log base 8 of 156.8. Log base 8, that's not on my calculator, but I have that change of base formula. So I have x is the log of 156.8 over the log of eight. Here you could have used the natural log if you wanted to, right? If you wanted to differentiate between this log base eight and this log base 10. As long as you use the same one, you're safe. X is roughly equal to 2.4309 2725. There. We'll end there for today. I only have one little example, but that'll be great for review next day. Great timing for once, right? Uh, any questions? So I did post the homework for 10.1 and 10.2. Obviously we haven't done 10.2 yet. I haven't gone through it to make sure um, there's none that I need to delete. And um, I will specify if I want the exact answer or the uh, approximation. So that's good. So it's good to, to know which is which. Um, yeah, so I posted the homework, but it's not due until I made it due uh, I think next Friday. So not this, yeah, the 30th. Awesome. Good. So you've got lots of time to work on it. But in case you wanted to get into it. Uh, and then continue. No, so I'll follow through with what you use. So obviously WebAssign won't like it if you, if you don't follow through and do what they tell you to do. Um, but I would work through and, and if you're do if what you're doing makes sense, then I'll just deduct marks for that first little little flub. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. So always start with your exact answer and then go for your approximate answer. Cool. All right. See you guys on uh, Wednesday. See ya.